We're going to hear today from Maggie Neal, uh, independent researcher and writer. Uh, it's going to be uh, for all of our, I know you guys love local history, we're going to be looking at... Uh, somewhat local. Somewhat local. I mean, it's early colonial, massive... Well, yep, England, yep, this yeah. part will cover Massachusetts, yep. Yeah. Um, uh, so the story of uh, Margaret Barrett Huntington Stoughton. I know. <laughs> Quite a handful. Um, that must have been fun to type out a couple of times. It's, it's worthy of its own presentation. <laughs> Let's put it that way. That trying to keep up with New England names is very challenging. It, it's, own, it's own era. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, I am so excited to get started. I mean, the textiles alone on the back got me really yeah. excited. Yeah. Uh, so with that, I'm going to shut off the light so we can see it a little bit better. Awesome. Um, and you can begin. All righty. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Hi there, so my name is Maggie Meal and I'm from Beverly, and originally from Minnesota. And um, I, like Graham said, and thank you for the introduction, I'm an independent researcher and writer, published writer. You may have seen some of my articles in North Shore Home Magazine. Um, so uh, my presentation is about 45 to 50 minutes and we'll have time for about 10 minutes of questions afterwards and then unfortunately today I have to leave at by 10.45. Um, so, and I also wanted to just do a, a land acknowledgement statement that um, we are privileged to be here at the Beverly, lovely Beverly Public Library and that we must acknowledge the indigenous people's long history of stewardship of this land and the painful history of forced removal and colonization that they have experienced. Now, the, the presentation today is based on a book project that I'm working on. I've been working on it for about four or five years now. And um, it, it deals with basic, the bulk of the project deals with Norwich, Connecticut, okay? But before we can get to Norwich, Connecticut, we need to talk about Margaret Huntington and her life. And she never lives in Norwich, but her sons do. Um, and the driving question I have is why would, um, many, many generations of the same family stay in the same town for over 230 years. That gets to be somewhat rare. Um, and that was my, that's been my driving question, but I've got many sub-questions too. Um, but basically my book project is about following the money and the merchant lifestyles of Margaret's descendants in New England, okay? Particularly Norwich and Eastern Connecticut. But first we start out in Massachusetts um, and Windsor, Connecticut. And then the book delves into the Revolutionary War era and then the fallout from that. And it's basically just trying to follow the money of, and this also happens to be my family line um, of Huntingtons. And there I am with my um, great grandfather, Parrot Fitch Huntington, who was born in 1886. Um, that was taken in Minneapolis in 1972. And that's kind of my connection to this whole project. Okay, so if we're going to talk about the Huntingtons of Norwich, Connecticut, though, we have to start with Margaret and her family. And we can't really study Simon. He's only in um, primary sources about two or three times um, because he dies, in, unfortunately for him, in 1633 um, aboard a ship called the Elizabeth Bonaventura coming over to uh, Boston as part of the Great Migration. Um, so today we're going to talk about what happens to her. 
And we need to know that very much so, that she's from East Anglia, her Barrett family, and that um, this East Anglia is going to play a role in, um, in sort of the settlement of Massachusetts Bay Colony, for sure. Um, who she was, where she and her family lived, uh, the fact that she did spend 38, almost the just bare majority of her lifetime in England, and then she comes over at about age 38 and spends 32 years in Massachusetts and primarily Windsor, Connecticut. She had two marriages, four surviving children, and five stepchildren. So uh, this is where Margaret was born, in Norwich, England. It's a, a well-preserved medieval city, and at the time, it was the second largest city in England, next to London. Uh, this building was probably built in the 14th century for a merchant family, and luckily it was saved in the 1920s by um, thoughtful preservationists. So we, because we don't know a lot about Simon Huntington, because he, we don't have his baptismal records, we have to study Margaret, and that's a good thing. Um, we, have to, we have to talk about a, a woman in history now. And we can piece together her life in about six to seven records, three or four of which her, her name is not in the record, but it is her. And I'll explain that when we get to those records. So she, she's born in Norwich, England. Her father's from Suffolk, the county right below Norfolk. Um, and then, but then she's going to take the boat over in 1633 and proceed to live in Roxbury, Massachusetts for a little bit, then Dorchester, um, and then on to Windsor, Connecticut, on the Connecticut River. So yes, this, I visited this house uh, in, the summer, in the spring of 2023, and it's called the Suckling House, and now it is a, it's been converted into a art house cinema theater with a cafe. And this is the cafe. But this is the original hall. This is Margaret lived here, the woman we're talking about. These are the original rafters, timber framing of a typical English hall of the medieval period, right? So her, her parents, her father was Christopher Barrett, and he's a rising political star in Norwich. Um, he, his mother was Margaret Pettyshell Wingfield Barrett Suckling. <laughs> many, many husbands. And then until finally the poor thing, she dies. Um, and he is Pr Christopher, this is Margaret's father, okay, is pine of an orphan. And he's taken in by Robert Suckling, a, a very well to do merchant in Norwich, probably the leading merchant, right? Um, he marries, has the um, wisdom to marry somebody advantageous to his own career, which would be Elizabeth Clark. We don't know much about her. Mar and then Margaret, I think, is born in the middle of six or seven siblings, um, two of whom are in some um, documents that I've studied, particularly a letter from Peter in 1649, which we will also get to. And it's important to know at this point that, as you might have guessed, uh, Margaret is a Puritan. Um, she, her, Simon Huntington is a Puritan. Her father is a Puritan. Um, but just because you're a Puritan, it, depending on the, the decade you're living in in England, you can be a little more um, outward about it, or you have to be underground about your religious leanings. Because you're, you're termed a nonconformist. And as you can imagine, that's not a good thing in general depending on the monarch in that's reign, is in their reign. Um, so uh, getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, her, her father is, is um, well-to-do enough that he does become mayor in 1634, right, the year after she leaves. But uh, we'll get to that also in a second. Um, but so she's from a very, the point I'm trying to make is she's from a pretty prominent family in Norwich, England. And they all intermarry um, their, with their king groups. And that could have been how she found um, Simon Huntington. So again, there, the, this is the Norwich merchant class we're talking about. And this is what, um, this is not Margaret, but it's a woman that is kind of walking the walk of what a, a practicing Puritan merchant's wife would have looked like. Um, black was actually the most desirable color you could wear um, in a textile, and it was very expensive. 
It looks to me like she's wearing some, probably some um, Dutch lace. The, the collar that we, we associate with Puritans, it's, it's pretty dolled up for this painting. And some jewelry and of course a headdress to be, you know, that was part of the, the wardrobe. Um, so again, her parents, her father is a merchant. He probably, um, he's part of this merchant oligarchy of merchants that run Norwich. Um, a lot of them are Puritans, maybe not all. They, in the past, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth, which is where, when Elizabeth was born um, in 1595, I'm sorry, Margaret was born in 1595 during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, which is sort of cool. Um, <clears throat> Elizabeth brings, uh, lets Dutch immigrants, they're probably uh, religious refugees from Europe, they are, they're Protestants, um, and they, she lets them come over because the Dutch weavers, because they're going to train the people of Norwich how to, be, how to make better cloth, better textiles, right? Uh, in East Anglia is very much influenced by what's going on in the so-called low countries, maybe even more than they're influenced by what's going on in London. I'm not, I don't know that for sure, but they definitely were very close to Europe. Okay, so this is the environment that Margaret and her family are growing up in, that she's growing up in. And of course, there would have been the apprentice system going on in that house I showed you. Um, the house is also a piece of cultural capitalism, they call it, where not only is your big family living there with some servants, but also um, you are doing your business there. This is, this is to show people, like, look at me, I'm a very successful merchant. And uh, these are some of the textiles that Norwich was producing at this time period. Um, particular, well, the one in the middle is a piece of Do Norwich Dornox, which was uh, being woven in the 16th and 17th century. It's kind of known for that. It's a, it's a textile center of England at the time. Of course, in the 19th century, it's going to become the north of England. But now, right now, at this time period, the 16th and 17th century, it's actually... Norwich, England. Um, and these, they were known for worsted wools, which are um, wools with a shiny surface created by hot rollers. All right, again, this is not a picture of the Huntingtons, um, but of a family of the era, the Chorley family. And um, I hope everyone can hear me. And um, so I just put it up there just to kind of get you in that mindset of sort of what they looked like all wearing sort of sad colors, um, the white collars on the men and the female, the male and the female um, family members. And he's re actually reading a Bible. Uh, Puritans were taught to read for sure because they had to read the Bible, but not necessarily to write, especially the women. Um, so we're not sure if Margaret could actually write. Um, so. She's going to marry this man named Simon Huntington who knew her father somehow. And it's gonna be a first marriage for her but probably a second marriage for him. Um, because he's got a son named William who shows up um, in records in New England in the 1640s. And so you can assume that it's a first marriage for Margaret. She's 27, uh, Simon needs to find a wife because he's, his, his first wife has died and he marries Margaret, and somehow he knew the family. Because you just didn't marry ever a stranger, for sure. And more importantly, you had to marry someone who uh, you, know, you knew uh, it was very important to have an advantageous marriage, or some guy that's not going to bankrupt your own family by his, if he's not a honorable merchant or trader. Um, OK, so they get married in 1623. <laughs> They have, uh, her, she proceeds to have her family pretty quickly, as you can see by the dates. Um, two of the older brothers are going to be christened or baptized at St. Andrew's Church, which is right across the street from their house. And um, Thomas and Anne are going to be uh, baptized at this church right down the street. I don't know if I already said this, but Norwich literally had 50 something churches at this time period. It was a cathedral city. And it does have a cathedral in the middle of it and 57 churches, parishes. So, yeah. And it's also, but 
It was also a, just a hotbed for nonconformists too. Um, again, that's for a whole nother presentation. But just know that it's not a sleepy little part of England. This is a very active merchant-based, wool trade-based part of England, East Anglia. And most of the people from the Great Migration are going to come from there, the majority, including John Winthrop Sr. and his group. But not all of them. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute too. But okay, so she's got her children. They're, they're having babies in the 1620s and they're surviving. All except for little Henry who dies in 1632 after about six months. Um, now that might have been one of the reasons to move to Boston, to make that huge decision to emigrate. But before we get there, let's just look at the, the churches they had to go to. Now just because you are a practicing Puritan, maybe at, your, at another town or in secret, doesn't mean that you don't have to go to church on Sundays, to a Church of England service. You do. Um, that is part of the law um, at that time. And now we're, we're talking about the reign of Charles I here. Um, so there's three records, uh, Church of St. Andrews, uh, I'm sorry. There's three records of Margaret and her family um, at, at least of her births, of her children at St. Andrews in their registry. And then there's a few more, there's two more and then, and then another church I'm gonna show you in a minute. Um, so we're talking about, it's the 1630s and there's a new sheriff in town really. He's the Archbishop William Laud. I don't know if any of you ever heard of him, but he did not like Puritans and he is allowed to start cracking down on them. And in fact, at, at, when they, the, the Huntingtons move at some point, they have a young family, they're raising their kids, they move literally down the street and start going to this parish. Wherever part of Norwich you lived in, you, you went to the church. Now this is a decommissioned church because they can't, the Church of England can't take care of all the churches they have. So you can see it looks really run down. Um, but by 16, in the 16, like 28 and 29, they're living in this parish. And um, Simon gets cited during the Church of England service one Sunday for not uh, following the Church of England service correctly. He's not doing things like bowing and repeating um, things that you're supposed to do in a Church of England service at that time. And he gets cited in a record. So you don't know what that means. Like that's getting, getting kind of scary because, you know, in the past Puritans had been killed for their religion, um, nonconformists, if you will. So he doesn't know what's gonna happen. Um, he's not liking things, he's feeling uncomfortable. There's also an economic depression going on in the 1630s where trade is at a standstill. Um, and he's, like I said, he was cited in 1629. Um, in the meantime, I don't know if I mentioned it, there is one other place where he's mentioned in the record. Let's see here. Well. He, he's also mentioned in records um, in 1628 in the, in the Norwich Merchants um, like directory as being a grocer, along with his father-in-law, Christopher Barrett. So I hope you're, hopefully you're following along with me so far because it is confusing. Um, so he's got his, his, you know, the Barretts are influential people. He's a junior merchant. They're trying to make it. It's an economic depression going on. They're Puritans. They're, William Laud is starting to crack down on Puritanisms, so they're making plans to go to to England, to, to America. But before we get there, let's just look at a couple of pictures. Um, on the left is Strangers Hall. It's a merchant um, museum, a house museum in Norwich. And on the right is the Undercroft at the Suckling House where Mar Margaret was born. Uh, the, the Undercroft is where they would store their goods. These are pictures from Strangers Hall. Again, the Merchant House Museum. They called it Strangers because that was how they referred to um, the Dutch, the Dutch uh, merchants and traders and weavers that came over in the 16th century to help out the English. That's why they call it Strangers. Um, 
There's a parlor on the left, you see the oaken walls, the classic English Tudor style. And then we see heavily carved boxes or, or chests, one for papers, and the other one like a blanket chest with a tulip motif. Tulips were very popular um, at this time period. This is Elm Street, a famous, well, many times photographed street in Norwich, England. One of the things that's great about Norwich is it, it did have a fire in the early 1500s, but they quickly rebuilt. So it still has medieval architecture that you can see. London famously burned in 1666, so it's pretty much of a Georgian uh, you know, architectural city. Uh, most of their medieval buildings were burned, but not Norwich. Um, and some of the weavers would be weaving up in these um, second floors. Okay, so by, like I said, by 1632, they had had a death of a child. Things are uncomfortable. They decide to immigrate to, to New England. They're going to go to John Winthrop's Massachusetts Bay Colony. And I used to think when I was studying that like, oh yeah, they'd be in a, in a wagon with their stuff and they'd be like going out to Yarmouth Port, which is, in, is the port of East Anglia. Um, but no, they would have taken their things on these rivers. Rivers were the highways of the, you know, 16th, 17th, you know, those are the early highways, right? On barges, everything was done by the river from the inland port of Norwich, um, England, to Yarmouth Port. Okay, so uh, they're going to take their things, be pretty organized about it, hopefully, have a lot of supplies, and... Um, they're going to meet a boat called, a ship called the Elizabeth Bonaventura II. It's captained by a Puritan um, pilot captain, if you will, uh, who's already done a lot of coast-to-coast -coast runs. Um, he's friends with John Winthrop. In fact, he was part of the Winthrop uh, Arabella group to come over in 1630. So he knows what he's doing. And in fact, they're going to make record time. It's, everything's going great. They leave in, a in April. They arrive in early June, six weeks. However, there must have been a smallpox. It could have been anything. They write, it's written in a, a record that it's smallpox that, he, that Simon dies of. So her husband dies aboard the ship in that six week time period. It's not recorded in Winthrop's diary, but he does record the arrival of this ship. And he says there were no deaths, but there was. And um, they have a day of Thanksgiving when it arrives because it must have had a lot of supplies that they needed. They always needed supply boats to come. Um, of course, when Margaret and her family arrive in June of uh, 1633, right? She's now the head of the family. There's you know, there's people already living here. <laughs> They've been living here for centuries, thousands of years, and um, they're being drastically affected by the English coming, with the, you know, disease and, you know, land seizure and all sorts of weird encounters that they have to deal with. But um, that's the way it is back then. And these are the various um, Native American tribes of that era. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about the Pequots and the Mohegans, but of course the Narragansetts were in Rhode Island, the Wampanoags, Massachusetts. Um, and over here is where Margaret and her family are going to end up, uh, right above Harvard at Hartford in Windsor. Um, these are going to be called the River Towns. Um, there's the Connecticut River. And just while we're on this slide, eventually in 1661, her sons will immigrate or like travel over, um, take some, be given land by Chief Uncas of the Mohegan tribe, and they will settle at the, the big, at right here at the Thames River. That's getting a little ahead of ourselves. Um, this is another place where Margaret's name is mentioned in the records, which is pretty unusual for a woman of this era. Um, and it's in John Eliot's um, Roxbury Register. He was the first minister of the first church in Roxbury, which is high up on a hill. I don't know if you've ever been there. Roxbury is incredibly hilly. It's got the Roxbury Pudding Stone. Um, it also uh, housed a lot of uh, Continental Army soldiers during the Siege of Boston in 1775. 
it's not that easy to get to, but it's worth it. Um, anyway, so she's in, 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 she's been able to join John Elliott's, uh, his congregation and he, he registers her and he puts her name down in his register. And it says, Margaret Huntington, widow. She came in the year 1633. Her husband died by the way of the smallpox. She brought blank children with her. So even, he didn't know how many kids she had. Um, and what's interesting is that um, in, the, in the history, in the histori historiography of the Huntington family, it's always been questioned how many children they actually had. Some, for a while, some people thought William was Simon's brother. No, he was his son, Margaret's stepson. And, but again, like even John Eliot doesn't know um, how many people she's come with. And on the left is sort of a reimagined um, first era meeting house, New England meeting house. They were very small and usually had sort of a pyramidal, pyramid roof. So the title of this presentation is The Widow Who Stayed. And I, I'm doing this, I'm saying this because, gosh darn it, you could have gotten back on a boat and gone back to England with your influential family. Your, your father is about to become the mayor of Norwich, the second largest city in England. That was a big deal back then. But she stays. Not everybody stayed it, during this time period. In fact, there's a woman who wrote a whole book about it, Susan Hardman Moore. And she posits that upwards of a third of um, the Puritan immigrants, if you will, the people that come over during this time period of 1630 to 1640, that's the general time period of the Great Migration, they went back. They couldn't hack it for whatever reasons. Towards the end, they kept started going back because they wanted to fight in the English Civil Wars. But not everybody stayed here. So Margaret stays. And, um, but that would have been something she would have had to have thought about. I mean, can you imagine arriving in Boston in 1633 and you, you have no male protector? You don't have anybody you don't have relatives here. They came as a family group. They didn't come as part of a congregation. But the guy she's going to marry eventually does come from a part of a congregation, which is unique. It's called the Dorset Group. Has anyone ever heard of the Dorset Group from Dorchester, Mass? Yeah. They travel as a whole congregation. But they're from the south of England, completely different probably than East Anglia. It's kind of like she's about to marry this guy, like I said, Thomas. It's like someone from Maine may be marrying someone from Texas. I mean, that's going to be a little bit of a different cultural shift, poss possibly. Because, yeah, so she, she meets a man named Ensign Thomas Stoughton. He's from a pretty well-known um, family group, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, he's already been a widow for five or six years with... A few, he's got about three or four daughters and one son. And we know that they got married because it's, there's evidence in a letter from his step-nephew, Ralph Cudworth, from the Cudworth family is from the South Shore area, which you might see Cudworth Road when you're going down to the Cape or whatever, Hingham. And he writes in his family that his uncle, Thomas, they're from, originally from Somersetshire, is going to marry a widow with means, meaning money. Or, or, you know, maybe it's just cows. Who knows what she brought over on, they, they brought over the both. Well, cows were your wealth. It starts with, it starts with cows. And then, and then hopefully you can get land. Remember, all the way through when I'm talking about this stuff, there are no banks at this time. Your money is in your land and in your animals and in your commodities and your excess um, I forget what that's called, but just any excess um, production that you have, that's where your money is. There's no banks. All right, so you can imagine now, she's thinking about marrying this guy, Thomas Stoughton, but it would have been thought about. You don't just marry somebody because it, as a woman, once you get married, you are literally owned by your husband. Um, so, but she's going to do it. The Stoughton family, I want to go through this a little bit because they're very interesting and again, they're worth their own presentation. Um, they're all children of the silenced minister, the Reverend Thomas Stoughton um, Sr., 
who was silenced in the early 1600s and died a pauper. Um, his children might have had a lot of grievance about that, and of course they're going to all head over to New England, um, including Israel, who is Thomas's younger son. Has anyone ever heard of Israel Stoughton? He was a pretty well-known guy in Dorchester, owned a mill, um, very wealthy, and um, so that's one of Thomas's people, people that are sort of more well-known than he is himself. Um, but what's interesting about this is, is Israel is that his son is William Stoughton, one of the witchcraft, witchcraft, as I put that in quotes for sure, judges, um, and he is the worst one. He is the most adamant about um, this thing going on in Salem, these accusations. In fact, he is, I just read this recently, he is one of the people, the jury actually found Rebecca Nurse not guilty, and he made them go back and find her guilty. It's him. So this is Margaret's stepson, or no, stepnephew. So, wow, you know, this is, this is a mindset of a Supreme Court judge of Massachusetts. They're staunch Puritans. They think they're better than other people, for sure. Um, but Thomas Jr., <laughs> who's actually older than Israel, by about 10 years. He becomes a constable, fence viewer, juryman. He's got a lot of um, somewhat political roles in uh, Dorchester, and he will again in Windsor, Connecticut, but he's not a leader of any of the um, settlements that he, he joins. Um, he does, he is known for these very undecipherable letters that he wrote to John Winthrop Sr. in the 1640s and 50s. Do, having to do with a, a lot of the religious controversies that were happening, including the Halfway Covenant, um, which was a compromise about who could get baptized and who couldn't, um, and that the fact that you know it, the Halfway Covenant—I I should just read what it is because I always get confused. It was a religious political solution adopted by 17th century New England Congregationalists that allowed the children of baptized but unconverted church members to be baptized and thus become church members and have political rights. Well, as you can imagine, you know, some people are going to feel threatened by that because they don't want newer people having political power. And it, it, it's going to cause all sorts of controversies in this time period that Margaret's aging in. Again, another slide with Thomas Stoughton. It's so important. And I showed the cows because how many cows you had was critical to your livelihood. The, the dairy, you know, the milk you could get to make cheese that Margaret would have known how to do, most likely. And your ability to ship cows potentially down to Barbados or slaughter them yourself and pack them in, in barrels. Um, there's evidence that the Huntingtons were Coopers in this, this first generation, or her sons that were Coopers. You need to be able to make the barrels to ship the beef and you needed to have the cows, like it's all connected, right? So cows are very important, your herds, um, so he meets Margaret in 16, or he, they marry either in late December of 1634 or 1635, and we know this because of the Cudworth letter. That's, you can get that, if you want to see that letter, it is located at the Connecticut State Library. Um, and also, so by the time they get married, um, they're already thinking about moving. I, I have to hope that he told Margaret, hey, I think we're going to uproot from Dorchester now and move to Connecticut, which was a wilderness. And this, this group does do that. Um, so she, she must have known. Um, so a couple things to think about when this Dorchester group that had already moved from Somerset, they're a group, they moved to Dorchester, Mass. They lived there for a few years. And now they're deciding to move to a Connecticut River encampment, if you will, settlement. And they do that. Winthrop doesn't like it. They, but 50% of the town of Dorchester, Massachusetts, in 1635 and 1635, got up, sold their houses, and moved to Connecticut in the biggest first wagon train in American history. Um, yeah. And it's, that's the frontier. 
And so Margaret was a part of that. But the other thing that's happening, did anyone ever hear about the hurricane of 1635? Um, category five hurricane, the biggest hurricane ever to hit New England it happens in 1635 in that Rhode Island, Connecticut area. So they're, they're moving to Connecticut at kind of a bad time. And, and Winthrop kind of notes that in his, in his diary is sort of like a, like, ha ha, you want to leave my Massachusetts, but you know, good luck to you. And you know, things were not well in Connecticut country is what he writes, something like that. Um, so I hope it's making sense to you. They've lived in Dorchester, they found each other, they're gonna have a blended Brady Bunch type family. That's very typical of that era. And they're gonna move in 1636, finally, um, to the Connecticut River, um, to the settlement of Windsor. And it's not that easy at all. They have to build a fort. They have a military protector, this man named John Mason. And they have their religious protector or, or you know, leader, the Reverend John Wareham. And they're going to go there and set up uh, against the Connecticut River. There's a place called the Great Meadowland where they can put their cows out to pasture. Remember, Boston was already packed by 1635. So that's one of the reasons they move. That's probably the main reason is land. So they build a fort. They would have spent a lot of time in this fort because things were tense. The Native Americans, they don't know what to do. Like they're, it's very confusing time and the English are coming in and there's people coming in from England itself and trying to reboot Saybrook. Um, and then people from Cambridge are going to Hartford, people from Another town are going to settle Weathersford. It's all happening in this, this time period. Um, so it's going to cause problems with the Native Americans, as you could imagine. And the Pequot don't like it at all. They want to fight. The Mohegans uh, wisely, in their opinion, decide to shoot, side with the English. And then it culminates in a war in 1637. It's not really a war, but um, with an attack on a Pequot fort in Mystic, Connecticut. It was brutal. It was a genocide. Um, they burned a fort alive and because there have been so many problems with some deaths of fishermen and other things happening um, on both sides and Mason just goes down there with a bunch of English um, soldiers or militia men and attacks the fort. And you know, it, it, it's, he, he, you can tell, like, these are tough people, the English, but he even had, to, he wrote a defense of it later in his life, so you could tell, it, even he felt like he had done something that wasn't okay, and in a lot of people's minds it would have been okay because they were scared of Native Americans, they didn't understand Native Americans' lifestyle and their use of the land and et cetera, and, it just, you know, it's, it's so tragic, but it happened, and they don't have our 21st century mindset, except, again, he, he had to write a defense of it. So he, he was this, you know, this very controversial figure in early New England history. Um, and there is a, stat, a big, like, statue of him in Windsor, where he, or no, Saybrook. Um, but he moves around with the Huntingtons, actually. The Huntingtons become friends with him because he and the Huntingtons keep moving to the same settlement. So if you were a, a young man at this time period, you're going to move three or four or five times in your life um, in order to um, gain more land and more political power. That's, that's the way you did it. So you could, you could plan on moving two or three times, and that's just what happened to Margaret's sons. We'll get to that in a second. So this is the Windsor Palisado. Um, and again, during these trades trying times, they would have gone to this fort, this, this um, refuge a lot of times. They couldn't even plant crops in the first couple of years. It was very dicey, this, this Windsor settlement that Margaret finds herself in. Um, though at Stoughton did own a lot of land. He, he owned 150 yards, um, they owned yeah, he owned different parcels of land in Windsor, but again, he was not a leader of the Windsor settlement. 
Um, okay. So what, what would life have been like out there on the frontier of Connecticut? Um, well, one of the things to keep warm is that Connecticut in particular is known for are these bed rugs. Um, you can see them in a few museums, including the Met. Even, even uh, the Wendon Museum has one. And they're basically, it's like making a really nice carpet, wool carpet, and putting it on your bed every night. Because how else are you going to keep warm? Um, especially if you don't have a full like bedstead yet with the curtains and not, not everyone had that at this time. Remember, textiles were incredibly, an incredibly important commodity. Especially, think about it, you come over with all of your textiles, your clothes, and then a few years out, there's no, nobody's weaving anything. The town of Rowley was created to bring over weavers because there was no cloth. So your clothes are getting pretty worn out by the 16, late 1630s. Like you can't keep turning your dress over. Anyway, but they didn't waste anything, as you know. Um, so they made bed rugs. This is a beautiful one. This is from 1785. Um, Connecticut was known for their bed rugs, um, but they were making them. They're in the inventory of Margaret's uh, stepson. So we know it was called, like a, it, it was referred to as a flocked bed rug in, in the um, Thomas Stoughton III's inventory. Um, she would have had to have been a very efficient housekeeper, an herbalist. And boy, I, I, I hope they were training her as a child in Norwich, not just to sew samplers, but how to make cheese and how to butcher an animal and all those things that she would have needed to know how to do. But they definitely, women of this era and up into the 19th century, you know, they knew how to um, concoct herbal remedies and such. And, and they had, you know, books, guidebooks about things like that. Um, one thing that's interesting, I don't know if you noticed, that she only had one daughter. Her name was Anne. She chose not to get married, and that, again, is in a letter from 1649 when um, Margaret's father, Christopher, dies, and they're trying to figure out who's going to get some money because Margaret's children are the only surviving heirs of all of her brothers and sisters back in England are the kids that are in, that are aging, they're in their teens or 20s, and they're in New England. So they're all going to get a little um, inheritance, including Anne, and they say something about the fact that she's preferring not to marry in this letter by her brother Peter in 1649. That letter is at um, the Connecticut, no, 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 yeah, no, this is Connecticut State Library, too. Um, so they would have been studying the Bible every chance they got, also spinning, spinning flax, spinning wool. Um, one thing to think about is Connecticut um, had their own witchcraft accusations going around during some of the times when their, their communities were stressed. That's usually when a witchcraft accusation would happen. That's what happened up in Salem, but it happens, wow, like three or four decades earlier in in Connecticut, um, but John Winthrop Jr., he's to me one of the most interesting characters um, in all of Connecticut early, early history. Um, he puts a stop to it, but not before Alice Young is hanged in 1647 in Hartford, but she was from Windsor, and so Margaret definitely would have known about that, and um, they, people believed in, in extraterrestrial stuff and um, spec you know sometimes spectrals maybe not John Winthrop Jr. again though he he cut he shut shut stuff bleh. he shuts this down um, by the 1650s and 1660s um, the other thing big thing that's happening during this time period is that um, it's already a couple of decades after the Pequot War, but a Native American servant um, was out helping his, uh, you know, English family in uh, the fields outside of Windsor, and he gets attacked and killed. That's in 1659, and I'm, I'm sure there were more, potentially more incidents like that. Um, one of the things to think about is why the Native Americans and English, there's so many different reasons why they had a hard time living together, but one of them is the, they hate, the Native Americans hated the English cows. 
these domesticated animals because they got into the Native Americans' corn stores that they had in the ground. This is what's going to cause the problems later with King Philip's War. And, you know, you'd be pretty mad too if everybody was eating, your, if these animals that you didn't never seen before, these domesticated cows are like attacking your food for the winter. So that's one of the reasons for the tensions. All right, let's keep going to the second generation. Um, um, now we're going to talk about Margaret and Simon's children a little bit and then come back to Margaret in the end. Um, William went up to the Merrimack Valley area, like the, the uh, Merrimack Valley River in the 16, probably in the early, early 1640s, maybe even, he may not even ever made it to Windsor. Um, and he helped establish Salisbury and Amesbury. So that's her eldest stepson. And he may only have been a couple years older than, than Christopher. Um, Christopher and Simon are going to go to Saybrook first in 16, I think it's 1647. They're going to go and try to resurrect Saybrook. Saybrook is never a, a very um, prosperous colony. It doesn't do well. And they're going to go try to reboot it in, 16, in the late 1640s. Um, and Thomas is living with the Stotons and Anne. Um, they stay the longest in Windsor. But later on, Thomas is going to marry a woman from the New England, New Haven colony, Hannah Crane, and go with that part of that colony after, and probably in rejection of the halfway covenant, and just to get new land. Um, they decide to leave. They're, they're so mad about New Haven being absorbed into Connecticut colony that they move in 1666 and, and find, found the town, the English settlement of Newark, New Jersey. And what's interesting about that is that's actually the last official Puritan settlement experiment, if you will. It's Newark. And so he does that in 1666. His mother had just died, Margaret. And he was kind of the outlier, okay? But Christopher and Simon are gonna stay together. And just, you could presume that she stays with her mother and then stays with the Stotons upon her mother's death. They just stayed with the Stotons. Um, these are the Saybrook years of Christopher and Simon. Simon is the, man, the, the son that I study um, because I'm starting to go with his line of descendants in my, in my book. Um, but they both travel to Saybrook and that's when we get the, Peter, the letter from Uncle Peter Barrett who talks about their inheritances and other things like the next time you order supplies you got to be more specific because you ordered the wrong bullets. And that shows that Christopher was, you know, an, you know, still new to merchant, merchant um, administrative details. So it also proves that the Barretts were still helping the Huntingtons, the Huntington sons. Um, and maybe that's why Simon and Margaret moved in the first place. That could have been one of the reasons to be, a, you know, representatives in New England for their trade. Because we know that everybody's going to start trading with Barbados at this time. Barbados is already on the map, and they're starting the whole like triangle trade, sugar, bringing food and supplies down to Barbados, and us bringing the sugar and the molasses up to New England. Um, Christopher marries a Windsor girl, Ruth Rockwell. Simon ends up marrying Sarah Clark, who's from Hartford and like Cambridge. Um, they both have large families. That was typical, we know, of the second generation of New Englanders. Um, they have a lot of sons, so they can keep that Huntington name going. And I just think that it's, it had to have been one of the largest colonial American families because there's so many of them. Uh, they're very hard to track down. Well, they're not hard to track down, but you have to, when you're studying the Huntingtons, you have to make sure you've got the right one because there's like 10 Hannah Huntingtons in the span of 16, 1750 to 1800 and I literally have like a map of who they are and who they married and it's, they, everybody got the same name basically. Um, again, that could be another presentation too, is just Puritan naming patterns. <laughs> and I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about, right? It's just everyone has the same name. Um, so 
Tom or no, Christopher and Simon are stay with Margaret and the, and their um, a, you know stepfather for a few years, and then they go off to Saybrook with John Mason. They keep following Mason, and they try to like resurrect the Saybrook colony, and it does not go well. Um, the crops don't do well. The the, black, the crows are getting into the crops. There's another. Um, witch scare or accusations of witchcraft, which again, like usually happen when um, places were under stress, like Saybrook was in the 16th, um, in this 1650s. Um, Christopher and Ruth get married first and their first three chi children die. Simon, who's a bit younger than Christopher, gets married to Sarah Clark and they immediately start having a family and they're gonna have 10 children. Um, so there's reasons, so they're starting to look for a way, they, they still want to like, Simon and Christopher still want to move again because they don't have enough political power in Saybrook and also the conditions aren't right for them. First of all, Saybrook is right, has anyone ever been to Saybrook? I mean, it's right on the Atlantic, Long Island Sound, it's exposed, it's the, 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 uh, the land is not great for crops. It's and there's like it's just it's not going well there. So he Simon and Christopher band with a few other um, people, including um, a man named Lieutenant. I think it's Samuel Bacchus, a Bacchus who's also from Norwich, England, has origins in Norwich, England, and a man named Lieutenant, Lieutenant Thomas Leffingwall, John Mason, and um, a minister named James Fitch. He's a very popular young minister. Oh, and his wife dies. So all these bad things are happening in Saybrook, and the Puritans always looked for signs for everything. There was always meaning to things that happened, whether they were good or bad. So there were plenty of signs for them to move again. And what they're going to do is um, do a land deal with Chief Uncas. He's a leader of the Mohegan tribe, and he um, does business with John Mason and Lieutenant Thomas Leffenwall. Um, there's more things that happen that align them, but we'll just say that they, they were aligned. And um, Uncas basically bequeaths for a nominal amount of money, nine miles of territory up near the head of the Thames River, where the Chetucket and the Yantic come down. It's a very safe area. It's rocky, it's hilly, still not the best land, but they take it. And I don't know if anyone's ever been to Norwich, Connecticut here. Anybody? No. It's very, very historic. It has a lot of black history, Native American history. Um, it's just a Revolutionary War history. I mean, they're getting ready for um, the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence soon that's happening in 2026. Um, they're all excited about it. But Norwich is going to be a very prosperous center in Connecticut. In fact, it's, it's the biggest one up until the Revolutionary War. It's, it's consistently rated, um, you know, ranked the highest um, for taxes purposes, meaning the wealthiest citizens. And it starts in 1660, 1660 when Christopher and Simon and the whole group, part of Saybrook, moved to Norwich. Um, again, like, what are the other people in Saybrook doing? Like, why is everybody leaving? You know, and also think about this too. Like, you couldn't just join a group and hop around to all these different towns. You had to be invited. You, just because you wanted to go to Norwich, well, you better pass the test. It's almost, I sometimes think of them as like Puritan country clubs. <laughs> and it's kind of that mentality, I think. Like, you just couldn't move in or out of a town just it, you, you, you sometimes even visit. Like it was just very closed, um, you know, mindset that they had about letting in strangers. You know, we hear that word again. So um, they're setting up their ideal religious and um, capitalist community now. Another one, and remember, like religion and capitalism go hand in hand with the, um, the Puritans, and they're you know they're like. And this is the green, it's like a perfect town green. It's very well preserved. Many of the homes still exist. Um, Simon's land was down here. Christopher's over here. They've got the Reverend James Fitch. 
Um, they've got a good, um, you know, probably 50 or 60 families. The river is down this way. And um, there's good water sources, but also a ton of rattlesnakes. And, uh, and wolves, but rattlesnakes were a real problem and there were bounties out for them. And so in fact, sometimes these bounties for wolves and rattlesnakes would result in a town going bankrupt to pay for the bounties. Yep. So Margaret's last years in Windsor, um, Thomas dies in 1661 at age 70, roughly. Um, no, 1660. Um, he had made out a will in 1645, right after his older, or younger brother Israel dies in the English Civil Wars. Of course, he leaves, he leaves it blank. He doesn't put in Margaret's name. It's like a generic will almost. In case she should die, he leaves it blank, but he provides for his widow. You could presume that she stays in um, Windsor. She did, as far as I can tell, she did not move with Simon or Christopher to Norwich. She stays in, in Windsor and lives out the last five years with Anne, most likely, okay? Um, and, but, but his son, Thomas Jr., would have inherited all the furniture and everything, most likely um, in the probate. And a lot of those things would have been probably purchased or gained from her money because we know that Stoughton needed money and he married a, a widow with means. Um, I already mentioned that Thomas Huntington found a Newark. He's gone right after his mother's death. But before she dies, she must, you know, she gets sickly in, right, in 1664, 1665, who knows when. She's treated in, by John Winthrop Jr., who has a hospital down in New London where he lives. And, um, who knows if she went down to New London, it was a short ride, or if he came up to her, but he writes about that in his diary that he treated um, Margaret, you know, I can't remember exactly how he says it, but he, he references her in his own diary. Anne presumably stayed single, there's absolutely no records of Anne, and the, New England, and the Puritans and the Yankees kept very good records, no records of her. But what, one of the things that's interesting is that Christopher named his last daughter. So Christopher is her older brother, right? Now he's living in Norwich. She's still in Windsor with her, her stepfather family, now her stepbrother's family. And he names his last daughter Anne. And um, that would probably was for her. None of his, her sons named any of their daughters Margaret. And we have to remember that this time the Puritans are starting to name a lot of their children for hardcore biblical names, um, not necessarily English names. And there sometimes there's you know there's a Christopher, Simon, John, Thomas. Those are classic English names. You start to see in the Huntington family names like Joseph and Jabez and Nathaniel, those are more biblical names. So I don't know, she's not named though. She's never given, no one's ever named for her, which I think is kind of sad. And I'm not named for her, by the way. I'm named for my Irish grandmother from, great grandmother from uh, Wisconsin. <laughs> but um, there's a picture of John Winthrop Jr. And um, those are the primary sources I used to build this presentation and that's my presentation. Any questions? <laughs> yes, in the back. On an earlier slide. What? Er on an earlier slide, I yeah. saw the term Mercers. Uh huh. What is that? Mercers were um, merchants that dealt in textiles. Yep. And grocers dealt more like uh, groceries, commodities, you know, um, spices. Uh, and those two words are kind of used interchangeably in that um, Norwich Directory of Merchants in 1628. Mercers, grocers, the Barretts and the Huntingtons were mercers and grocers, yeah. So mercers more is like textiles. Uh huh. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. So her sons, you mentioned her sons became Coopers as her profession. Were there other professions? Okay, yes. So that's a really good question. 
So they're, they're, they were trained to be merchants, um, you can predict. They're, they're in that, their, their father, their grandfather, everyone's a merchant in the Barrett Huntington circle, right? But what do, you could, they're not necessarily mer full-blown merchants yet, but they're traders. And they have to build barrels. They have to make barrels in order to ship their goods. So they need to learn how to be coopers. And um, in some of the probate inventories of, particularly in Simon's, um, in his children's probates, are Cooper's tools. So that means they're making, they're, they're just, they're doing the whole, like, circle of what you need to do to trade down to Barbados or up to Canada. Um, so they're making the barrels. They're, they're slaughtering their hogs and cows to be salted and put in barrels. And then those barrels go down for trade. Um, and that's how you start to build wealth. So you, you need to know how to build um, the barrels. There were no cardboard boxes, no refrigeration. It's all salted meats in the back. So with the barrel making coopers and everything, beer? <laughs> um, well, women brewed beer, women brewed beer, um, and cider. Cider was actually uh, really important to early New England, and but it, women also knew how to brew beer. Um, and one of the first things you planted in your new, um, on your new settlement were, were apple trees. There's evidence of that. The Roxbury Russet Apple originates in Roxbury. Uh, it doesn't take that long to start getting an apple um, harvest. And also, the, these types of things that the New England Puritans were missing from home would have been going, coming in shipments, hopefully, from England. Because they, you know, in some years were starving years. They didn't have a lot of food. Um, I mean, they had food, but again, it just depended on the year. If they didn't, if the crops failed, then you better get supplies from England in those first years. But New England was Massachusetts Bay Colony was the mo one of the most successful colonies. Salem was not that successful. Saybrook not so much. New Haven gets absorbed. Um, you know, Massachusetts Bay Colony was the strongest one, in my opinion. I, you know. Any other questions? Well, oh, yep, go ahead. I just found it so fascinating that the cows were such a big issue. Mm. And uh, you said that they had their corn holdings down below. The Native Americans, yeah. Were those treated somehow? Because I remember when um, the first um, Mayflower settlers came, they were having trouble um, uh, getting pellagra or some kind of disease. That, uh, and the Native Americans showed them how to add calcium from oyster shells or yep. whatever shells and then mix it with the corn yep. to make hominy. Mm -hmm. you, could, you could be absorbed more and it, right. it, it did. Well, the English had to start eating corn, that's for sure. Cornmeal, like samp, they called it, or um, hasty pudding. Everything was based on corn because they couldn't grow great flat wheat here. We didn't do that well in New England, so they had to quickly adjust to a corn crop and, and change their ways. Um, but of course, the Native Americans had been using corn um, throughout their history as, as a sustenance. And they, like I said, they stored it in the ground, but then the English cows and pigs are getting into their corn stores. And you know, you'd be mad too. And it's just this lack of understanding and then the English would get mad because the Native Americans would set up traps because they were so hate, they hated the animals so much, the domesticated cows and pigs, that they would set traps in the woods. And then you could come out and find one of your cows in a trap. And this is gonna lead up eventually to King Philip's War. I mean, the, not only did the Native Americans and English kill each other, but the Native Americans took down all, as many cows as they could during that very brutal war. Um, so they, they weren't just killing, um, you know, that war involved killing a lot of domesticated animals. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? 
All right, well, thank you so much. I'm so appreciative that you uh, took the time to come here today. And um, I do have a website, you know, if you want to read more about this family, it's maggiemeal.com. And I have a, um, a, my card is up here. Thank you.